Victory Church, come on, if you're excited to be in the place, you better open up your mouth and say so. Come on. <laughs> oh my goodness, what an honor and a privilege it is to be with our Hamilton Mill family today. In case you didn't notice, I, I am not the pastor of this campus. Uh, although we are uh, brothers from another mother, I love, 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 love the Fritz so much. They're dear friends of mine. Can we just make some noise for Pastor Chris and Pastor Lisa? Just because. I love you. But, um, but no, in, in all actuality, my wife and I, my name's Curvin, and my wife Candace and I are the uh, associate campus pastors at our Norcross campus. So we are your victory neighbors right down the road. And again, I am honored today uh, for the first time to be bringing the word here at the mill. And I don't know if you're ready, but I'm ready. Come on, somebody. It's going to be a good time. So, um, so, you know, if I could just bypass the pleasantries, man, this series that we've been in has been absolutely astounding. Uh, we have been studying the book of Acts, and we've literally been taking it line upon line, precept upon precept. And we've been discovering uh, and, and really digging into the movement and the birth of the early church. Uh, I like to put it this way, uh, for those who may not be familiar with Scripture. Uh, if we look at the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, we see the story of what Jesus did. And when we flip the page into the book of Acts, we then see the story of what Jesus is continuing to do. Come on, somebody. How many of you know that the work he began then, he's still doing today? Come on, look at your neighbor and say, that's you. I don't know why your neighbor looked at you like that, like you were crazy. That neighbor was stuck up. Look at your other neighbor. Say, other neighbor, that's you. Right? We are the church. And the church of Jesus Christ is more alive today than it's ever been before. Don't let the media fool you. Don't let the culture lie to you. Can I tell you? The gates of hell will not prevail against the movement and the advancement of the kingdom of God. What a time to be alive. And as we look back at the early church, what we discover is that Jesus, after he accomplished his mission, he sends his spirit, he empowers the believers to be witnesses, to take the gospel all throughout the earth. And we see this beautiful picture in the book of Acts, and I encourage you to go back and check the previous messages out if you've missed any. But we see the church in this beautiful community. They're breaking bread together. They're spending time in, the, in, you know, in, in, in fellowship and they're re, uh, remembering and recounting the teachings of Jesus. But what the disciples and the early church quickly realized in their journey, they realized that there is actually a cost to following the name of Jesus. You see, this fierce persecution began to break out in the early church. And right at the epicenter of this uh, brutal persecution of the church, we find a young man by the name of Saul. And today we're going to take a look at the, the, the introduction to this, this individual named Saul. And, and we're going to look at the amazing transformation that God does in his life. But first you have to understand who this guy is. Saul, later on in scripture, he kind of gives us a bio of who he is. And he basically says it like this. If there's anyone out there who could claim to be the religious type, I'm the one. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. I'm born from the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised on the eighth day. Like, uh, I'm schooled. I'm zealous. I know my word. Come on. He was basically saying, I am that guy. Right? And the reality is that, yeah, Paul, Saul was the guy that if you saw him in church, he's the guy that you would think, man, he's got it going on. This guy had ministry in his bones. He loved God. He obeyed God. He was zealous for the things of God. He was educated. He had the proper upbringing and education. In fact, watch this. He's so zealous and passionate about the God of his ancestors that he is on a mission to destroy what he considers to be the heretics who are now following this Nazarene named Jesus. And he's on a mission to destroy the church. And in fact, we are first introduced to this man named Saul in Acts chapter 7. And we see him for the first time in scripture holding the coats of the men who are brutally murdering the very first martyr of the early church. Anyone know his name? Stephen. 
And that's our first introduction to this man named Saul. In fact, in Acts chapter 8, verses 1, it says this. It says that Saul approved of their killing him, speaking of Stephen. And it goes on to say that on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. And we catch back up with Saul in the next chapter, chapter 9, and that's where we're at today. And oh my goodness, I have a word for you and your mama today. Come on, somebody. If you're ready, say let's go. <laughs> let's jump right into it. Acts chapter 9, starting at verse 1. It says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. And he went to the high priest and he asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus. So that if he found anyone there who belonged to the way, whether man or woman, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Now you have to understand that what Saul is doing in this moment, he's taking the persecution that, that he's leading in Jerusalem. And he's so brutally and, and violently against the church that he's willing to take this persecution to the city of Damascus, which is 133 miles away from Jerusalem. That's a two weeks travel by foot. Now, I want you to, again, grasp something with me here. Saul is a man of great renown. He could easily send an accomplice. He could send an understudy. He could send an assistant to go and do the dirty work for him. But Saul was so aggressively against the church of Jesus that he wanted to make a statement by showing up in person to carry out the persecution of the church. He was on a mission to destroy anyone that followed what the Bible calls the way. A side note, isn't that such a boss way to describe the Christian faith? Come on, the way. Because think about it. Back then, the church is not even a year old, okay? And so back then, they weren't called Christians. They didn't have these massive gatherings like we have now with LED screens and lights. No, these people were meeting in homes, and they were just trying to figure this thing out and doing life together with one another. And, and, and I love that terminology, the way. Because in that day, if you were to ask a Jew, you know, like, what do you believe? Their response would be this. I am a follower of the Torah. I'm a follower of the Torah. Now, the Torah was essentially the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So basically, Jewish men would spend their entire lives studying the Torah. In other words, in essence, the word Torah means to teach or to guide. So they would spend their entire lives studying and discovering the way to God, the way to God. So by saying, I follow the Torah, that means, hey, I am discovering the way to God. And then we find Jesus showing up on the scene. And Jesus sits at the Last Supper with his disciples in the final hours of his life on earth. And Thomas, frustrated and panicked, says, well, Jesus, how will we know the way to the Father? And I love that Jesus looks him in the face and he says, Thomas, behold, I am the way. Come on. I am the one that the, prophesied, that the prophets talked about. I am the Messiah that David sang about in the Psalms. I am the one that the law foreshadowed. Come on. How many of you know Jesus said later that I didn't come to abolish the law, but I come to fulfill the law. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And Saul is on his way to destroy anyone that would dare come into alignment with this statement. So we keep moving forward in verse 3 of chapter 9. It says that as he neared Damascus on his journey, speaking of Saul, suddenly a light from heaven flashed all around him. And Saul fell to the ground and he heard a loud voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul's reply is, well, who are you, Lord? And Saul I'm sorry, and Jesus replied saying, I am Jesus whom you were persecuting. 
Now, I want you to notice something today. And one thing I love about this, this series, Pastor Chris, again, we're going line upon line. And if we're not careful when we read the word of God, we will bypass some very, very powerful truths. So the question we have to ask ourselves is this. Jesus didn't ask Saul, why are you persecuting them? He didn't say, why are you persecuting those people? Jesus proposed the question to Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why? Because you need to understand today that whenever Jesus looks at his church, he doesn't see it as an entity. He doesn't see the church as a building. He doesn't see the church as a gathering. He doesn't even see the church as a religion. Jesus didn't come to this earth to create a religion. He came to bridge the gap to instill relationship. When Jesus looks at the church, he sees an extension of himself. The Bible says that we as the church are actually the bride of Christ. So that way, whenever people say foolish things like, well, pastor, I love Jesus, but I hate the church. You better be careful when you say things like that. Because do you realize that's similar to you walking up to Pastor Chris and saying, hey, Pastor Chris, brother, I love you, but I can't stand Pastor Lisa." Look, you catch this Alabama boy on the wrong day, you might catch them hands. You might catch them hands. And let me tell you, they won't be holy hands either. Some of y'all looking like, really? Y'all ain't, let me tell you, y'all didn't know this. Pastor Chris is from the south side of Dothan, Alabama. Come on, listen. You pray for me, but don't play with me. Come on, somebody. (laughs) <laughs> so Jesus says this to, to Saul in this moment. He says this in verse 6. He says, now get up, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men traveling with Saul stood there speechless, for they heard the sound, but they did not see anyone. What an encounter. What a crazy moment. And, 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 and oh gosh, the Lord is so kind because Out of every message in the book of Acts, there was one that I would desire to preach. It's this one. Because I I can identify with Saul. Because I have a history and a past that would surprise most people. And I know what it's like to encounter God on the journey called life when when, when you're at your absolute lowest. And how many of you know today that the same God that encountered Saul on this Damascus road, he's the same God that wants to encounter you here today. He's the same God, yesterday, today, and forever. And the beautiful truth that I want to just share with you today is this. God loves you so much that he will meet you right where you are. But he also loves you enough to not leave you the way that he finds you. You see, there is a work that God wants to do inside of every heart. And can I tell you that work? It's not behavior modification. It's not us trying to be good enough. How many of you know we could never be good enough? We could never measure up to the standard of God. So God, his interest is not in your behavior modification, but rather God wants to do a work that consists of heart transformation, a deep work that takes place on the inside. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to leave this room today the same way that I came in. I want the transforming power of his spirit to do in me what only he can do. And I'm just curious, am I in the right place today? Do you want the same? All right. Well, let's get to it. Here it is today. Four truths of a transformed life found right here in the text. Here's the first truth I want to share with you today. Here it is. You need to know that your heart is being pursued by God. Now, I'm going to say it again because you need to truly grasp what I'm telling you today. Your heart, despite what you're going through, despite where you've been, despite how broken your life may be, you need to understand today that God, the God of all creation, is in a passionate pursuit after your heart. Can I tell you, Victory, nobody on this earth just stumbles into salvation. I know that you would like to think that maybe one day you just chose Jesus, but can I tell you, no one just accidentally finds Jesus. And we see this to be true 
in the most prolific parables that Jesus taught, right? We see it in the parable of the lost coin, the parable of the lost son, the parable of the lost sheep. We, we love that one where the good shepherd leaves the 99 sheep to do what? To find the one. And what do all these teachings have in common? We're lost. We are a lost people searching for a good God. And can I tell you something? There is no man, there is no woman on God's green earth that could ever boast that, well, yeah, that one day I showed up at Victory Hamilton Mill and, uh, brother, I found Jesus. My friend, it is impossible for you to find Jesus. Why? Because Jesus was never the one who was lost. It's you and I who are far from God. It's you and I who are desperate and broken and in need of a Savior. And in his loving kindness, he pursues the heart of man. And he cultivates moments in the fabric of eternity and time to bring us to situations just like today. Where you can hear about this God who's in passionate pursuit of your heart. Can I tell you, you are not the pursuer. God is the pursuer of man. You and I are the pursued. You're the apple of his eye. You're the, the object of his affection. I, I like to put it this way. Salvation is not the, the, the idea of you finding God. <laughs> Salvation, as it relates to us, is simply us accepting the fact that we have been found. The God of the universe is pursuing us the same way that he was pursuing Saul. In fact, we see it later in the book of Acts. Saul is kind of re retelling this story, this conversion moment. But he gives us a unique detail later in the book of Acts that we don't hear about here. Let's look at it. In Acts, fast forwarding to chapter 26, verse 14, Saul says this. He says, and in that moment when, when, when he heard the loud voice, he says, we all fell to the ground. And I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? For it is hard for you to kick against the goads. Now, time out. Pause. I have two questions. Number one, what is a goad? <laughs> and number two, why are we kicking it? <laughs> right? Right? Now, now, again, these are things we'll just read over and not take a minute to actually process. So what is a goad? A goad is an ancient terminology that, that they use to describe what we know to be a cattle prod. A cattle prod is a long stick. It's an instrument that farmers would use to herd cattle. Now, on the end of the stick, there was a sharp point, and basically they would kind of poke the cattle to get them to move in the direction that they were leading the cattle. Now, here's the thing, though. Oftentimes, the oxen would get frustrated, or they wouldn't want to obey the direction of the farmer that's leading them. And in their frustration and in their stubbornness, oftentimes they would kick their feet back, oftentimes accidentally kicking the goad, which would then puncture their skin and puncture their muscle, and it would actually wound the oxen. So, Pastor Kervin, what does that have to do with anything? Hear me today, church. What God is saying to Saul in this moment is that, my friend, you have been kicking against the goats for way too long. He's saying to him that I've been attempting to lead you into the way everlasting. Saul, I've been pursuing you. I've been trying to guide you and lead you into the purposes I put you in the earth to accomplish. However, you're being stubborn. You're not allowing me to lead. And you're kicking against the goads. And all you're doing is hurting yourself. And the question we have to ask ourselves today, number one, is this. What is causing me to kick against the goad in my own life? But we ain't going to go there right now. I'm going I'm to I'm stay with the text. But the, que the other question I want to ask today is this. What is it that was poking Paul? Saul, I'm sorry. What is it that was poking Saul and causing him to kick against the goads in his life? Well, me, for me personally, as I look at the context of Scripture, factoring in the real human emotion, I, I would imagine that there was some suppressed emotions that Saul probably felt about Stephen's death. 
You see, in Scripture, there's nothing in Scripture that is accidental or just coincidental. So there's a reason why we are introduced to Saul in the epic manner that we're introduced to him, standing over the body of Stephen, holding the coats in approval of the murdering of the first martyr of the church. There's a reason. And I believe that as Saul stood in that moment, Watching this young man be plummeled with rocks and with stones, and even in the midst of being murdered brutally, Stephen opened his eyes, and the Bible says he lifted his hands to heaven and said the same words that Jesus said on the cross. He said, Father God, please do not hold this sin against them. Saul, in that moment, watched Stephen die well for the faith. I would imagine that Saul's brain, his mind, his soul is flooded and consumed with all types of questions. How could these people die so well? How could they believe and, and be willing to lay down their lives for this lowly carpenter named Jesus from a town called Nazareth? How on earth could these people still love their neighbors the way they do? I don't understand. I would imagine that Saul was restless in his soul. I would imagine Saul wasn't sleeping that well. He feels guilty, he's confused, and he's looking for truth. But my friend, what I love about this encounter is that Jesus does not wait until Saul is sin-free and coming back to God crawling in mercy to encounter him. No, Acts 9 tells us this. It says that while, somebody say while. It says that while Saul was breathing out murderous threats, Jesus called him by name. So right in the middle of his hatred and anger, Jesus pursues him. Why? Because this is how God demonstrates his love to a broken world. The Bible says in Romans 5, 8, listen to me, church, that God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while, somebody say while, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Come on, aren't you glad today that while you were still broken, God called you by name? That while you were still confused, that while you were still depressed, that while your marriage was still in shambles, that while you were still far from God, he still met you in the middle of your mess and called you by name. That's the God that we serve. He doesn't wait for you to get cleaned up. He doesn't wait for you to get your life together. He doesn't wait for you to just figure out how to take that first step. God will meet you right where you are. It's right in the middle of this blood-stained journey that Saul encounters the very God that he was on his way to persecute. Hmm. It reminds me of the story of Lee Strobel. Honestly, when I hear the story, some of you may not recognize that name. Lee Strobel in the 70s, he, he, he would identify himself back then as a staunch atheist. Not even just an atheist, but a staunch atheist. I don't even know what that word means, but it sounds horrible. A staunch atheist. And he was in journalism. So for a living, he did research, and he acquired data, and he studied. That's what he did for a living. And so he set out on a mission to do enough study to disprove the gospel of Jesus Christ. He wanted to disprove and dismantle Christianity at its its root. And so he he took time off of work, and he's studying, studying, researching, researching. (laughs) But lo and behold, all of this study... And all of the aggression towards the church of Jesus came to a halt when one day all of his data and all of his information simply pointed to the truth that there is a God in heaven. And that God came to this earth in the form of a man named Jesus, laid down his life. And hear me, it was in 19... I thought I had the date, but I ain't got the date. But hey, but it was in the late 70s where Lee Strobel surrendered his life to Jesus. He surrendered his life to Jesus. He made him Lord and Savior of his life. And he took all of that data that was meant for evil, 
and he culminated it and turned it into a testimony, and he wrote one of the best-selling books on Christian apologetics known as The Case for Christ. And it has reached millions of people all around the world, and it has helped young people stand up for their faith in Jesus. Come on, somebody. The same thing that happened to Saul on the Damascus Road happened to Lee Strobel, took place in my life, and he can do it again in your life as well. Jesus is in pursuit of the heart of man. And hear me today, church. If you don't hear anything else that I say today, hear me when I say these words. Listen to me. The God of all creation is in passionate pursuit of your heart. And until Jesus is enough, nothing in this world ever will be. Amen. What's the second truth of a transformed life? Well, here it is. Not only is your heart pursued by God, but your blindness is healed by God. You see, I want to just kind of paraphrase this next segment for the sake of time. So God encounters Saul on this Damascus road. And then the moment that Saul gets to his feet to head into Damascus, the Bible says that he was blinded. He could not see anything. And the Bible says that his companions literally carried him by hand into the city of Damascus. And for three days, he was blind. Um, He did not eat. He did not sleep. He did not drink for three whole days, completely blind. Now, while this is going on, Jesus then gives a vision to another man in the city of Damascus, a believer, by the name of Ananias. Not to be confused with the Ananias from a few weeks ago. I don't know if y'all were here for that, but that brother, he gone. (laughs) This is a new Ananias. (laughs) If you know, you know. (laughs) But God tells Ananias, basically, he says, hey, I want you to get up. And he gave him clear instruction. He said, I want you to go to the street called Straight. And I want you to look for a man named Saul from Tarsus. Why? Because Saul is blind. I've blinded him. And he has had dreams that a man named Ananias was going to show up, lay hands on him and pray, and heal him of his blindness. So Ananias gets up, he goes, in fact, let's just pick it up in verse 17. It says, then Ananias went to the house and he entered it. And placing his hands on Saul, he said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, after this encounter with Jesus on the Damascus road, Saul was blinded. And again, we can't bypass These little nuggets here. The question we have to look in the mirror and ask is, why would Jesus do that? What does the blindness, what's the point of Saul being blind for the next three days? Well, what we know is this. The Lord makes it so that Saul's exterior reflects his interior. You see, up until this point, Saul had been blinded spiritually to the revelation of Christ. Which is why he was on such a passionate um, Pursuit to destroy the church. He was spiritually blinded. So Jesus takes this moment to make Saul's eyes just as blind as his soul is. Because the Bible says later on, in fact, I believe Paul scribed these words later. He said that the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. So there are some folks who don't don't understand the things of God. They're not submitted to the lordship of Jesus. So therefore, whenever they hear spiritual truths, their eyes are blinded. They can't truly grasp what's going on. And it's three days that Saul is in this state of blindness until Ananias comes and heals him. And in verse 18, it says that immediately after prayer, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes. And he could see again. And he got up, and what happened next? He got up, and he was baptized. Come on, immediately in this moment of of clarity, when his spiritual eyes are open, he then in that moment realizes, wait a minute, this whole time I've been persecuting Jesus, but Jesus was the answer all along. All the ancient writings that I've studied, all of the Levitical law, all the words of the prophets, everything is pointed to this soon coming Messiah, and he's been right under my nose the entire time. I once was blind, but now I see. Saul's eyes were open. 
And here's the truth, my friends. There's a lot of people in this world, maybe even in this room, who has, who has spiritual, I'm sorry, who has physical sight, but you're spiritually blind. And here's the deal. If I'm spiritually blind, if I'm spiritually blind, then as I look out at the world around me and I look at the issues in our society and I'm looking out at different people groups, if I'm spiritually blind, then I'm going to observe and engage everything in the world around me through a secular worldview. I'm going to view, by the way, a worldview that has been shaped by my sense of morality, my life experience, my expectations, my core fears, ultimately by my truth. But y'all know the problem with my truth, right? If my truth is different from your truth, then my God, whose truth do we believe? So I'm here to tell you today that we have got to allow the, the, the power of God's spirit to open up our eyes, to see the world through the lens of Jesus and not through our own filter. In fact, if I could just tell a, a pretty incredible story, as a teenager, I was far from God, y'all. I, I got high for the first time when I was 12 years old, and by the time I was 18 years old, I was a full-blown full addict. Cocaine, I started even smoking crack cocaine. I was in and out of jail, armed robbery. I mean, you name it, like I was, I was far from God. And I don't even say that right now to give praise or glory to the enemy. It's just that from time to time, you need to remind him that you are the one that got away. Come on, somebody. You got to remind him from time to time. That's all. <laughs> but y'all, because of my lifestyle that I live and my upbringing, if I could just be very transparent as a teenager, I had an issue with law enforcement. I did not trust the police. I just did not. I wouldn't say I had a hatred for them. That's a very strong word, but I didn't trust them at all. So I give my life to the Lord, and uh, fast forward a few years. I'm in Bible college, and I'm in full-time ministry. I'm a young man. This is about ugh, 15 years ago, 16 years ago. And at that time, I was doing Christian rap music. And, and that's what I did for many years before I became pastor. And yes, don't let the skinny jeans fool you. I will make it rain on you, brother. <laughs> I got bars. Young people, don't try me. I will make it rain on you. <laughs> but I got invited to this small little church, this tiny little church in this tiny little town in East Texas. Uh, the name of this town was Decab, Texas. Has anyone ever heard of Decab, Texas? Exactly. And let's just say there wasn't a lot of melanin in Decab, Texas. So I go there that night and I do a concert for the teenagers Saturday night, and I was going to preach the next morning for the adults. And so we finished the concert. God showed up, and it was powerful. Kids got saved, just a crazy outpouring. Pastor Chris, you remember those days back in the youth ministry season of, of our tenure. And, um, and after the service, I told the pastor, hey, I'm hungry. I'm going to go to Sonic down the road and get me some chili cheese fries. And uh, he said to me, he said, Kervin, now, you know, this is a small town. And they don't really like people out too late at night. And I said, nah, I'm good. I, now, in hindsight, I know what that brother was saying. <laughs> so I said, nah, I'm good. I'm going to get my chili cheese fries. I'll be back. I'm good. So I get in the car. I drive to Sonic. Sure enough, I ran a stop. I don't know what I did. I don't even know to this day if I ran a stop sign or not. But I look in the rearview mirror. Woo! Ugh! I pull over. The police officer gets out the car. He walks up to the window. He does the whole license and registration thing, so I give him that. He walks back to his car, and in that moment, because I know he's about to run my record. Now, again, y'all, I got a testimony. <laughs> Come on, is there anyone in this place you've been through some stuff? Look, I know some of y'all, y'all just holy, holy. Y'all you, you, ate manna for breakfast this morning. I, I, some of y'all speaking more tongues than the United Nations. I get it, I get it. You, you, you walk on your bathwater like Jesus did. I, I get it. But can I tell you, that ain't me. I've been through some stuff. So I'm sitting in that car, and I know what time it is. I'm thinking to myself, oh, no, my past. I knew he's going to see armed robbery, larceny, and we'll just stop right there. <laughs> so he comes back up to my car. I roll the window back down, and he said, Son, I'm going to have to search your car real quick. Can you pop the trunk? I said, yeah. So I pop the trunk. He goes to the trunk. And immediately I say to myself, oh, no, not the trunk. 
Why? I didn't have anything bad in the trunk. But what I did have in the trunk was some of the props from my concert. Now, Pastor Chris, you, you brought me out years ago, right? So you know I'm not, I'm not making this up. I was very theatrical in my concerts, and I had props. I did a bunch of silly stuff. So let's just say there were some questionable items in my... The cop goes to the trunk, he opens the thing up, and he found a straight jacket, a machete, and an Oprah Winfrey mask. <laughs> can't make this stuff. <laughs> the cop comes back to the car with his hand on his pistol and he said, son, what did you say you out here doing? <laughs> I said, I'm an evangelist. He said, son, get out of this car right now. <laughs> so I sit down on the sidewalk. I'm thinking, oh Lord, I'm about to go to jail tonight. I got to preach in the morning. Five minutes go by, three more cop cars pull up. They got the lights on, and they're out, and they're deliberating in a circle. I don't know what's going on. I'm panicking. Again, these, these core fears are rising up, and I begin to create a narrative in my head. See, this is why I don't trust the police. I'm out here trying to do the right thing, and here I am. All this narrative begins stirring up inside of my mind. And then all of a sudden, a fourth uh, vehicle, cop car, swung in. A guy jumped out, and this officer was young. He was a younger guy. And he ran over to the guys, and he's, he, he's talking to them. And it, the, the conversation seemed a little heated, if you will, a very passionate conversation. I don't know what was being said, but all of a sudden, that young man, he walked over to where I was sitting, and he grabbed my hand, and he lifted me up, and he said, Curvin, he said, sir, I want to apologize to you for what's happened tonight. You're good to go, but you need to know. Wait, wait, no, no, wait for this. He says, but you need to know, whenever I was a teenager a few years ago, I went to a concert at Maranatha Church down the road, and you were performing, and you shared your testimony, and it was on that night that I gave my life to Jesus. And he said, and Curvin... He said, in fact, since then, I've gotten married, and I have a child, and I'm just trying to be an honest man. But would you take a minute to lay hands on me and to pray for my marriage? Would you take a minute to just pray for my child? Y'all, I laid hands on that brother, and I called down heaven in front of that Sonic in Decap, Texas. Now, wait for it. It gets better than that. Because at the moment that I said amen, and when I opened up my eyes, all five of the other cops were around in a circle. And he said, sir, if you have a few minutes, would you pray for me? Would you? He said, would you pray for my family? Would you pray for this sickness in my body? Come on. We serve a God that will take what the enemy meant for evil, and he'll turn it around for your good. If you believe it today, why don't you shout unto God right now? Hallelujah. My God, hallelujah, hallelujah. And you might say, well, what does that have to do with Saul? <laughs> Can I tell you, it has everything to do with this moment of clarity when we allow the Holy Spirit to open up. God will use unimaginable circumstances to soften our hearts and to open our spiritual eyes. Because when I got in the vehicle that night, I wept all the way back to the house because God in that moment softened my heart for law enforcement. He began to eradicate that hatred and that aggression that I felt towards the law enforcement. Can I tell you something? God began to work in me then. Whew, thank you, Holy Spirit. He began to work in my life then that I didn't even know it, but it would prepare me to be an advocate, to be a voice during the race riots in 2020. Do y'all remember that season when the world was divided? Do you remember that season whenever churches were splitting left and right? When people were more concerned with being heard than they were with actually listening? Well, it was in that season because I allowed God to open my spiritual eyes then. In this new season, I was able to stand in the gap and to help people build bridges instead of building walls. I was able to stand in the gap between protesters and police. I was able to both educate as well as advocate. I was able to cry out for justice while also crying out for peace and if we're going to be the church that sees through the lens of God during this election year we better get down on our knees and we better cry out to God and ask him to open our eyes to see the world the way that he sees this world hallelujah 
I don't care what the topic is. It, it doesn't matter. It could be politics. It could be the LGBTQA+. It could be immigration, abortion, racism, education. Did I miss one? Or it can be the issues that, that, that hit closer to home. Questions we have to ask, like, how are we treating our neighbor? How do we extend forgiveness? How do we view honor? I mean, how do we view leadership? Whether we agree with them or not, do we honor them the way that God instructs us to in his word? Come on, somebody. Do we foresee freedom for the addict? Do we look at hopeless situations and do we speak hope into that thing? Do we have compassion for the disadvantaged? Because the reality today is this. When we're open, when our eyes are open, and we're healed of our spiritual blindness, like Saul's was, it changes everything. Because then I can no longer look at the broken world around me through the filter of my truth. I can't look at the hurting and disadvantage through the filter of my conviction and my experience and my bias. No, there is no truth. And I believe today that the transformed life calls us to look at all things through the one truth that matters. Not your truth, not my truth, but the objective truth that is found in the word of God. Come on, do you believe it today, church? You know you're transformed whenever your spiritual blindness is healed. And thirdly, another truth of the transformed life is this. Your past is forgiven by God. Oh, thank you, Jesus, for a past that is forgiven by God. No, the reality is that this is one of the hardest hurdles to cross in our salvation experience. To think that God could forgive us after all that we've done. But I want you to pay attention to how Jesus calls Saul in verse 3. He says that, the Bible says that as Saul neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Also, a quick fact, there's only seven times in scripture where God would speak to man and call them by their name twice. And it meant Deep concern, deep empathy. So in this moment, this violent man, Jesus had every right to call him by his sin. Liar, murderer, ruthless, heartless, pitiful. But in this moment, Jesus didn't call Saul by his sin. He called him by his name. Can I tell you today, your past does not disqualify you from God's grace. Well, Kervin, I've done this. I've done that. I've been here. You don't understand my life. My friend, Saul was killing Christians. Jesus is fully aware of the life that you live. He knows the decisions you made 15 years ago, last night, and guess what? Here's a spoiler alert. He knows the sins you have yet to commit. But yet his grace is sufficient. And there's a big difference, hear me, there's a big difference between mercy and grace. Sometimes in Christian circles, we just kind of link the two together. I thank God for his mercy and grace, but no, no, no. Sometimes we have to actually separate the two to truly understand the power that is in God's mercy and the power that is in God's grace. You see, God's mercy is simply defined as you not getting what you deserved. And I don't know about you, but whenever I was a recovering drug addict 20 years ago, sitting in rehab, going through withdrawals and throwing up every single night, and I heard about the mercy of this good God that would give me a clean slate, that would forgive me of my sin and give me a new chance, my God, that was enough for me. Just his mercy alone, someone told me in that season of my life that Jesus, Kervin, Jesus has taken the cross that you should have carried to that hill. My God, that's enough for me. But do you want to know the moment that transformed my life? It was whenever they then said, but Kervin, the beautiful thing about the gospel is Jesus took your cross and then he gave you his crown. Grace is undeserved favor. It's unmerited kindness. It's unearned goodness. The grace of God, I put it like this, I love to say it this way. Grace is proof that God is way better at forgiving than you could ever be at sinning. 
And I know this firsthand because I've given God many reasons not to love me. Ooh, can I just be honest? Even, even since I've become a Christian, I've failed. I've made mistakes. I've had mountaintop moments and valleys. I've given Jesus many reasons not to love me. But I can say to you today, church, that he never chose one of them. His grace is and has been and will always be sufficient for me. And I walk in that today. Can I tell you something? I walk in that today. And you, my friend, wherever you are, there is freedom that you can walk in this day. And I thank God for that moment 2,000 years ago when my sin was placed upon Jesus. And when Jesus was nailed to a cross. Come on. In, the, in Deuteronomy, the word says that cursed is he who hangs on a, on a tree. And Jesus took my sin and he became my curse as he took my punishment upon himself. And can I tell you something today, church, in this journey called life, not every moment will change everything. But my God, there are some moments that will absolutely change everything. And it was on that day that my sins were removed from me as far as the east is from the west. I wasn't made better. I was made new. Why? Because Jesus didn't give up his life to make bad people good he gave up his life to make dead things live and that my friend is the grace of a good God and it's grace that is available to you this day your past is forgiven and the last truth today I want to share of a transformed life here it is your future is then prepared for God your future is then prepared by God and for God. Again, your past cannot and does not dictate your future. You, you may say, well, there's no way God could use me after all that I've done. But can I tell you what I've discovered in this journey is that it's the broken places and it's the valley and the desert seasons that often will produce the sweetest fruit in our lives. And while we're walking through all that we've walked through, what we don't realize in the moment is that God is actually using that as a training ground and as a platform to walk into your purpose. I don't know if you've ever heard it said like this, but I'll say it. God has uh, a thing for taking your mess and turning it into your message. But he will take your trials and turn it into a triumph. There's nothing that you've ever done that could disqualify you from the future that's in front of you. Your past does not disqualify you from your future victories. There is no past defeat in your life that will disqualify you from doing what God has called you to do. Amen? So as I close today, and again, I'm a guest, so you know guest speakers get two fake closes. <laughs> this is my first one. At least I'm honest. So I don't know how versed you are in this story, but spoiler alert, this violent man named Saul who had this encounter with a kind God, he goes on to be the greatest evangelist the world has ever known. Later on, his name is actually changed to Paul. And we'll talk about that later, I think, in chapter 20, I believe. But here's what you may not realize. This violent man that was persecuting the church after one encounter with God he then goes on to write 13 of the 27 books found in the New Testament. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful that Saul's response to God wasn't, God, you can't use me, so I'm going to go ahead and sit in this pew. I'm thankful that he said yes to the purposes of God in his life. Come on, I'm thankful. We wouldn't be here today. I'm thankful that Saul gave God his yes. And look at what happened next in verse 19. It says that Saul got up. And he was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. And Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. And at once, somebody say at once. And at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. Now notice this. I want you to know, it says it at once. He didn't wait. Well, there was a little brief period. There were three days. Remember the three days where he was blinded? So, yeah, God set Saul for three days. 
Now, can I just say something to all my believers in the house really quick? We're family, right? All right. God sat Saul for just three days. But some of us have sat ourselves for three decades. We're sitting on the sidelines, waiting for everyone else to do the work of the ministry. And we have all the excuses in the book. Woe is me. Well, I don't really know that much scripture. I've only been saved for five minutes. Well, how about the lady at the well? She encountered Jesus, and she became the greatest and the first evangelist in Samaria. Well, I don't know that much scripture. I don't sing. I can't preach. I don't know how to do. I got ugly toes. I don't know. It's going to ride the bench. No, stop it. Stop it. Life is too short for you to sit on the sidelines while a dying world goes to hell. No, we got to get to work, church. God has been too good to you for us to sit back and to just hold in this grace and not share it with the world around us. Hear me today when I say this. God did not save you to sit you. God saved you to send you. Come on, it's time to get to work. If you're far from God, if you don't know him, today is the day of salvation. If you're a believer, if you don't serve in a group or serve on a team, it's time to take that one step. It's time to lead something. It's time to join that marriage ministry. Come on, mom and dad. It's time to prioritize getting your teenager to youth on Wednesday nights. Right? It's time to invite that friend to church. In fact, I have two friends that I've invited. They're unchurched. They don't know the Lord. And I invited them. They're going to be here this next service. And I believe by the power of God that they're going to surrender their lives to the Lord. I believe it. Come on, what are we doing? Time is winding up. There's wars. There's, there's not even rumors of war. There's war happening right now. Can we not discern the times? We've got to stand up, give God our yes, and allow him to do what only he can do. Amen? Because you have a future prepared by God that your past cannot hold you back from. Amen. So as I close, for real this time. In the 1700s, there was this man by the name of John Newton. And John Newton was the captain of a slave ship that would bring men and women from Africa to the colonies. I mean, honestly, I mean, it was kidnapping, extortion, murder, slavery. And he did this for years. I mean, literally... The worst of the worst. I mean, I think we could all agree to that. The worst of the worst. But somewhere along his journey, in 1748, aha, here we go. This is the date I was looking for earlier. In 1748, right in the middle of this horrible life that he was living, he was introduced to the gospel. Jesus met him just like he met Saul. And this man surrendered his life to Jesus. Now watch this. Not only did he surrender his life to Jesus, he completely repented from the life that he was living, turned from it. He got ordained as a minister. He became a pastor of a local church. He, began, he became an evangelist. And he became an active uh, abolitionist, fighting against the slavery that he was once employed by. And near the end of his life, as he sat down thinking about the grace of God, he sat down at a piano with a pen and a pad, and he wrote these lyrics down. He wrote a song about his transformed life. He wrote a song speaking about how much of a wretch that he was, but how God's grace was more amazing than his sin could ever be. He wrote about how lost he used to be until he was found by God, of how blind he was, but by the mercy of a good God, he now could see. And it's the heart cry of every life that has been transformed by the power of God. So I want you to stand to your feet. And as we close, I want us to sing this song together that many of you know. But now that you know the story behind it, I pray that it resonates in a deep way. Amen. Come on, let's sing together.
With every head bowed, every eye closed. You know, in this moment, there's really not much left to say. I feel like the goodness of God has been clearly felt in this room today. He loves you, my friend. He's not mad at you. He's not angry with you. We make this journey with Jesus so hard. But Jesus said, come unto me, and I will give you rest. My friend, if you're tired in your soul today, there is rest for you. And I want to introduce you to the God that is able to change your life. I'm going to count to three, and when I do, if you're here, and if you would say, Kervin, I'm ready to surrender. I'm ready to make Jesus Lord and Savior of my life. It doesn't matter whether you were raised in church your whole life. Maybe it's your first time in church in a long time. It doesn't matter what you did yesterday, last night. It doesn't matter. None of it, all that matters in this moment is how will you respond to the God who's given everything for you? Today's the day of salvation. This moment is not coincidental. It's not by chance. God has literally orchestrated every fabric of your being, of your interactions, to bring you to this moment. So here it is. I'm going to count to three. You would say, Kervin, I'm here. I'm ready to make Jesus Lord of my life. One, it doesn't matter who's beside you, who's around you. It's not about them. This is between you and God. Two, you would say, I am ready. I'm tired of living my life my way and hitting a wall every time. Today, I mean business with God. If that's you, one, two, three, just lift your hand right where you're at. I want to pray with you. Just lift it up high enough and long enough for me to see it. I see those hands. God bless you. God bless you, sister. God bless you, baby girl. I see you. A young one right here. God bless you, sir. God bless you. God bless you, brother. Anyone else? I see that hand, young man. I see that hand. Come on, even out of the mouth of babes, out of children, the glory of God will be put into the earth. And I want to lead you in a prayer. We're all going to pray this prayer together with our friends. Come on, church. Say, God, you know who I am. I've made mistakes. I've broken your heart. And I've broken your law. But I believe that my life can change. You are the son of God. You died for my sin. You rose from the dead. And I put my faith in you. So come into my heart. 
forgive my sin and heal my mind. I repent from my old life and I turn to a new life in Christ. Thank you for loving me when I was unlovable. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Come on, I wish I had about 10 people in this place who would say amen and shout unto the Lord in this room. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on.